Amen. Amen. As we continue with the Gospel of Matthew, we are looking this morning at how not to be right with God. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you real, real simple, people try to be right with God, but not going through and not knowing God's Son. For example, I had lunch with a brother here from church a couple of weeks ago, and he was telling me about this, the sin he had had for years, and And he couldn't have victory over it. And he kept on wanting to be right with God. And he would do everything he could to be right with God and to have victory over sin and and be religious and whatever it was. And he said he finally came to the end of himself one time. He said, God, I give up. And it was at that moment he said that God met him. And, And I can attest to that. That's exactly what happened with me. My sin was a different sin, my my big sin. But nevertheless, it came to the point, I went to church all the time. I went to Catholic church. I was a good Catholic on Sundays, and the other six days were six other days. I went to confession. I was an altar boy when I was a little kid, and, and I did my best to be religious. And, and, and way back, this goes back into the 1980s, I used to watch Pat Robertson on TV. And I remember he'd come to the end of his program, and he'd say this thing called the sinner's prayer. And, and I would say it, but all it was was words. And I had never come to the end of myself, and it finally came to one night many years ago, back in the late 1980s, when I wasn't living out here, I was living at the beach, and I came to the end of myself and said, God, I, I don't care if I, I, if I ever get over this thing, this sin. I said, I'm done with it. I can't. I keep promising you I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be that good man for you now, and I'm never able to. I said, I don't care if I ever get over it anymore. What I want to do is I just want to know you. I give up. He was trying for years to get me to the place of giving up. Stop trying to get right with me by doing the right thing. You come to me, you surrender to me, and I will take you, I will change you, I will transform you, I will save your soul, I will give you victory. And that's what God does. But we meet these men this morning that are trying to be right with God, and they really don't want the Messiah. They don't want to know Lord Yeshua, the, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't, they don't see themselves as sinners. What they see themselves as is really good religious people who are going to work their way into heaven. So you want to get there? Okay, this is where we're going to go. We're going to that place. We're going to go there via the Sea of Galilee. Remember where we were. We left off. Jesus had fed 5,000 men plus women and children, probably 25,000 people, with two fish and five loaves of bread. Remember that? Quite the spectacular miracle. Evening came. We saw it last Sunday. Evening came. He sent the multitudes away. He sent his disciples into a boat across the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He went by himself on the mountainside to pray. Late at night, in fact, early in the morning, when it was dark, the disciples were out there in a storm all night long, and Jesus came to them walking on the water. That would be cool to see, wouldn't it? And then Peter gets out of the boat. He walks in the water toward toward Jesus, and then he looks at what's going on around him. He looks at the waves and the wind, and he begins to sink. Jesus reaches down. He saves them. They both get into the boat, and now there is calm, and they sail from the middle of the sea to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and that is exactly where we pick it up, beginning, first of all, in chapter 14. Been on the boat, been in the sea. We pick up in chapter 14, verse 34, and when they had crossed over, They came to the land of Gennesaret. They crossed over the Sea of Galilee. The storm was done. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent out into all the surrounding region, and they brought to Jesus all who were sick, and they begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched his garment were made perfectly well. If you're with us, Earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, you remember we covered the passage in the Bible where the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of Jesus' garment and she was healed. Remember that? She had an issue of blood for 12 years. She touches it. She's healed. It's likely that others had heard of that and they went, wow, there's the one who fed the thousands of people yesterday. This is the next day. Let's go after him. He's the one who healed that woman. All she did was touch his garment and, and, and she was healed. Wow. He's here in our town, in Gennesaret. Let's go and get healed by him. The first thing we notice 
is our God who cares. They come to the land of Gennesaret, verse 34. It's on the other side, because that's where Jesus had sent them. They were in the storm, and they still continued to the other side. According to Josephus, in the days of Jesus, Gennesaret was a small but beautiful uh, plain. It was located between Capernaum and Magdala. It was lush. It was extremely fertile, fertile. And it produced a wide variety of crops consisting of fields and orchards and vineyards. It was irrigated by four large springs. And it was such a wonderful place that they were able to have three harvests per year. And the soil was so rich, it was all devoted to farming. It was a quiet, peaceful place with all types of wildlife. It was a great place to get away to, a great place to rest, a great place to retreat. Hence, if you go to Israel today... You see very similar places like that right now. This is called a kibbutz, or kibbutz. It's on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. This is a Nath Gineser. If you've ever been to Israel, you've gone to this particular kibbutz. This is where the Jesus boat is. But it's a really pretty place, and a lot of the kibbutzes are very restful, very peaceful. In fact, the place where you have St. Peter's fish, when you go to the Sea of Galilee, it is also a kibbutz. But what kibbutzes were, they were started pre-1948, pre the days when Israel was recognized as a nation by the UN. And as Jews were migrating back to the land of Israel, they were attacked by the Muslim people around them, and they formed these kibbutzes or these communes where they would arm themselves and they would also farm the areas and, and gather together to protect themselves from enemies coming against them from the outside. And these kibbutzes still operate today and many of them are like this area that we, we see here called Gennesaret, a great place to rest, a great place to get away, a great place for retreat. So Jesus ministered yesterday to the 25,000 people with the fish and loaves. And then, at nighttime, while he seeks some rest with his father, the disciples are on the storm in the sea. And what happens? Jesus has to come and he rescues them. And he saves them. He gets into the boat. He goes to the other side. Wow, what a great place to have another opportunity to rest. However, it doesn't turn out that way. Verse 34 tells us, and verse 35 tell us, when they got to the other side, this peaceful place, that the men of that place recognized Jesus and they sent into all the surrounding district and brought all who were sick. So much for Jesus being able to find rest and retreat. And all, verse 36 tells us, as many were brought to him as, and as many as touched his garment, they were healed. Now here's what's interesting here. So Jesus does his great miracles, follow the timeline. He feeds the 5,000 plus women and children, 25,000 people. Spectacular miracle, right? Storm at night, another spectacular miracle. He calms the storm and he walks on the sea. Even Peter gets to walk on the sea. He comes to the other side and, they are perform and Jesus is performing all kinds of miracles again. If you follow the timeline from John's gospel, after Jesus does this great healing of these people here at the end of Matthew chapter 14, the people get upset. What they say to Jesus is this, Math, uh, John chapter 6, verse 28, they say to Jesus, what will it take for us to be able to do the works that you do? In other words, Jesus, this is really cool that you fed people. And we heard last night you walked on the water. And now you're healing all kinds of people. What can we do to do the magic tricks that you do? What can we do to be like David Copperfield? Tell us how to make an elephant disappear. You know, that kind of thing. That's what they're wanting to know. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, it even goes further. And the, and the Bible tells us that they said to him, what sign will you perform so that we may believe? Now understand what he just did. He just fed 25,000 people with two fish. You get it? He, he performs his miracle on the Sea of Galilee. He comes and he's healing all these people so much so that they touch his garment while they are healed. They've heard of him. People are coming from all over. Woohoo! They're all excited. And then they say, Give us one more sign. Then we will believe. Why is that? Here's the problem Jesus did all these things. And then after Jesus did these miracles, he began to explain to them who he was. He explained to them, John 6, that he is the bread of life. 
And the only way you are going to come to the Father in heaven is by going through him. They did not want that message. They didn't dig it. That was not the thing that they wanted to hear. You saw the bread I did yesterday, the miracle of the five loaves and feeding everybody? Listen, I am the bread of life. You are sinners in need of salvation. You must come to me and take of me and and surrender yourself to me and receive me as the forgiveness of your sin. Then you can go to heaven. They didn't want that part. So they say, show us a sign. One more sign, then we'll believe. It's, It's absolute foolish. What else happened? Bible tells us this. In John chapter 6, right after that, from that time, after he says, listen, he's done all these miracles, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They liked the miracles. They liked the magic show. But when they realized, wow, he's not just going to give us free food and and give us bank accounts with, with money in them and all this kind of stuff, he's telling us we have to repent of our sin and receive him for the forgiveness of sin. We don't want any of that. Even some of his disciples A disciple is a learner of a teacher. So I'm not talking about the apostles. A learner of Jesus. Even those who had heard his message and were following him around the countryside saying, woohoo, yeah, this Jesus Yeshua guy, he's cool, this is great. He finally gets to the heart of the matter. It's a matter of the heart of their sin, of the sin of their heart. And they say, eh, they follow him no more. So Jesus then, he turns to them. He turns to the 12. It gives you the, the idea that everybody left except for the 12. There were multitudes of people here coming out from everywhere. Then he turns to the twelve, are you also going to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Now it's interesting to note how merciful Jesus was. Jesus knew the condition of their hearts, the ones he healed, the ones he gave the bread to He didn't turn any of them away. The problem was they turned him away. Here's the issue with the people. They looked to God for what they wanted. Give us the miracle. Give us the magic show. Give us the free food. You know, bread and circuses kind of thing. Fill our bank accounts. They looked to God for what they wanted, but they cared nothing for what God wanted. Uh, We can do that too, even as Christians. God, help me with this, do this. I've got this trouble over here, fix this, fix that. Without really caring for what God wants. Uh, What's their problem? Jesus wanted to do much, much more for them. He wanted to heal more than their diseases. He wanted to heal their sin-diseased souls. But they could not see past their wants in this life because they did not concern themselves with the next life. Before we move on to the second thing, understand this. This life is temporary. Is there, figure that out, right? Okay, here's the deal. You are going to die, right? You are going to go on into the next life. Every single thing here is temporary, all right? Uh, let me explain it uh, another way, okay? I'll use my mother-in-law as, to help you <laughs> illustrate it. So <laughs> this is not a mother-in-law joke. So back in May... Uh, my mother-in-law's condominium, it, it flooded. And uh, so the insurance company is going to put her up in a hotel room. And I thought, well, that's not, you know, no, we're supposed to honor our father and mother. So she moved into our house, right? And we, we all learned a lot over the course. And, and it was good. You know, listen, my, it, anyways, let me move on. So she moved back, her condo, she moved back into her condo yesterday, right? But imagine if she had moved into Motel 6 or something like that. Listen, she knew it was going to be temporary, right? So it would have been crazy for her to empty her bank account and decorate her motel room or put a little landscaping plot out inside of her front door entrance to her, her motel room, right? And, and likewise, at our house, it, she's not going to empty her bank account to do all these things at our house. She knows that it was a temporary dwelling place and she's going to be going to her other home. So she's passing through in a much greater sense. You and I are passing through this life on and into the next life. But these people are only concerned with their Motel 6 now, right? Their bank account now. Listen, it's storing your treasure in heaven. People will spend all their money on the things of this world that are passing away. 
and then die and stand before the Lord. Man, we have an opportunity to store treasure in heaven by what we do, by what we say, by how we do things, to love others, to care for others, how we spend our money and on down the list. It's recognizing I am passing through. But they were only concerned about what I can get today. Build my kingdom here. And they weren't concerned with the things that God was concerned about. Make sense? Let's move on. Number two, we meet the Messiah who confronts. First of all, Jesus heals everyone who comes to him, even though they rejected him. For the most part, he still cared for him and loved him. Then we note the Messiah that confronts, because now he goes to the, 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 the religious leader. So it appears, we'll see in a minute, that the multitude are still there, and then these religious leaders are there in their presence, and they're going to confront Jesus. And then, verse 15, chapter 15, verse 1, and then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem, they came to Jesus saying, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Look at verse 3. And Jesus answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. In a nutshell, Here's the issue that Jesus is confronting with the, the scribes and the Pharisees on. They were concerned with covering up sin. This is what's going on here. But they were not concerned with being forgiven of sin. It, it appears that what had happened is this. A, a little bit of the, the culture and the facts and the history, all right? Give me a couple minutes with that. Help us to all understand it a little bit better. In the Galilee region, the Galilee region was mixed with Jews and Greeks and Romans, very secular culture, but there were Jews there who had their synagogues. And down in Jerusalem, it was extremely conservative. That's where the Jews and the, and the, the, the Jews who were the, the real scholars lived and dwelt and, and ministered there at the temple. In fact, in Israel today, it's very similar to that. Up in the northern territory by Tel Aviv and the Sea of Galilee, you will find a very secular culture, a real mix. You go into Jerusalem, it's extremely conservative. You have Jews, you have Muslims, and you have Christians, but they are all extremely conservative. You go up north toward Galilee, it's, it's very secular. So very similar. In the Sea of Galilee region in the days of Jesus, much more secular. They were Hellenized. And uh, so in, in the Jews, as they would go to the synagogue, the problem was they had a real problem with Jesus. Jesus was attracting enormous crowds. He was healing people. He was saying things that they had never heard before, and the attention was being given to him, and he was letting them know, I am the Messiah, I am the answer to the prayers, I am the bread of life, and on down the list. And when the scholars from Galilee would confront Jesus on a question or confront him with a problem, seeking to twist Jesus and make his words have no effect. The problem was Jesus would always take their words and twist them back on them. So they didn't have an answer and they didn't know how to respond to Jesus. So what they did is they sent for a delegation of scribes and Pharisees to come from Jerusalem because in Jerusalem was the best of the best scholars, were, were the smartest of the smartest scholars. So the, the, the delegation comes from Jerusalem. That's what's happening here in verses one and two. They come from Jerusalem to put down this Jesus and put down this Jesus talk once and for all. But it doesn't go well for them. So this council from Jerusalem comes, the delegation from Jerusalem comes to question Jesus. And they say in verse 2, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition, the tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus shuts them down. Verse 4. After he says, why, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? He says, for God, verse 4, he commanded, saying, honor your father and your mother and your mother-in-law. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, look at this, verse 5, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me as a gift to God, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy 
about you saying, these people, they draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So let's understand what's going on here, right? The Pharisees and the scribes, they come to Jesus and they say, hey, uh, your disciples don't wash their hands before they, this has nothing to do with personal hygiene. It's, there's a ritual cleansing, I'll show you in just a second. It has nothing to do with personal hygiene. Listen, in the course of a day, our hands get dirty, right? You should wash your hands. You're shaking other people's hands. They're coughing, they're sneezing, they shake your hand. You, know, you, wash, you, you should wash your hands. You use facilities, wash your hands. It's the right and proper thing to do. You wouldn't think of eating without doing that. But this has nothing to do with personal hygiene. This is a type of Jewish ritual or ceremonial washing. So let me illustrate for you. In the Jewish religion, if you have a Jewish background, you understand exactly how this is. There are certain rules that are taken from the Old Testament, but they have been changed and updated, so to speak, fitting the traditions of men and the rules of men. For example, as things work out today, it is unlawful to work on the Sabbath, right? So when you go over into, you go over to Jerusalem, you will see something like this. It's called a Shabbat elevator or a Sabbath elevator. Now, how many of you have been to Jerusalem before? How many of you have been stuck on a Sabbath elevator? Once you, yeah, once you are on a Sabbath elevator, you will never be on one again. You've learned your lesson. I'll explain it to you. This is what happens on a Sabbath elevator. Uh, a Friday at sundown to Saturday at sundown, there is one particular elevator that is automatic. That is so no Jews will go into the elevator and work by pushing a button, right? Unlawful to work on Sabbath. So that elevator, guess what's going to happen? You're going to find out. It's dinner time. You're way up there on the 19th floor. It's dinner time. You're thinking, woohoo, I'm hungry. You get onto the Sabbath elevator. Guess what it does? It stops. You have no control over it. Neither does anybody else. It stops at every single floor. And the doors open up, whether there's anybody there or not, and you wait, and then it closes. So that nobody can work by pressing the button. It stops on every single floor. You arrive at dinner, the dinner's gone because you got there an hour and a half later than you thought. You will never go on a Sabbath elevator a second time. That's today. They didn't have the mechanical things back then that we do now, like elevators, but they did have this washing of hands. And so here's what, what, what's going on what they're talking about, washing the hands, same thing takes place today, same thing. How you would wash your hands, not hygiene, it's ritual cleansing. You take a pitcher of water, you pour it on your left hand this way, and the water runs off, right? Then you pour it this way, and the water runs down your elbow and runs off. That's all it is, no soap or anything. Then you do it with your other hand, running off and run off. And that's what they are saying. You, you know, you've got to go through this ritual in order to be right with God. This is not how not how to be right with God. Now, notice this picture has two handles. Here's why. You see these all over Jerusalem when you go into the facilities. Uh, they have two handles. Here's why. Because if you wash your hand with the right handle, this hand is still dirty, right? Your hand is now clean, right? You couldn't touch the same handle because th now your hand's going to be dirty because your dirty hand just touched it. Now this hand's clean. So you indefinitely or forever and ever have dirty hands. So how do you solve that? Two hands. I'm serious. It, it, it's true. If you've been to Israel, you've seen it. So you've got the two hands. So it's this thing that Jesus is saying. He's letting him know, listen, you guys, wh what are you doing? They've mer made the word of God no effect. And, he's, and you have scribes and Pharisees here. Ezra was a scribe. Ezra was a good scribe. You recognize his name from the book of Nehemiah and also the book of Ezra. But he was a good scribe. Some 500 years after Ezra, you come through the time of Christ. And what scribes were known to do, even in the days of Ezra, they were to copy the word of God from the original manuscript, right? They would copy it word for word, jot for jot, tittle for tittle, everything, right? Not miss a thing. But where there are passages that were difficult to understand, in the margin of their paper, their parchment, they would write an explanation or an interpretation. If you have a, Bible, a, 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 a study Bible, for example, 
you have notes in your study Bible, very similar concept. But by the time you get to the days of Jesus after Ezra, they just added more and more interpretations and more and more explanations. And this is what Jesus is getting at. You've got all these interpretations and all these explanations of what God's law meant, and you are missing the mark. They all point to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the problem that they had. It happened with Judaism back then. It happens with Judaism today. And, and I'm not saying this to offend you if you have a Catholic background, but listen carefully. In the Catholic Church, you have that today. I know from personal experience. If it, if the word of the priest is holy. And if the priest should ever make a mistake, which is undoubtful, they ever will, the Pope's word is always holy. So much so that the Pope's word is taken above the word of God if there's some kind of contradiction. Uh, understand this. Um, I'm not making these things up, all right? Check it out for yourself. I have an aunt that's a nun. She is a wonderful lady. She's 90 years old now. She really is a wonderful lady. And, uh, she came to, uh, she's been in the Catholic Church every day of her Catholic life. Never went anywhere else except for here. One time, I think it was about five, six years ago, something like that. She came in these doors. She'll never go back to a church that's not Catholic again. But she came in here the one time, and afterwards we had lunch, and, and uh, we were, the family was talking about church and what she thought. And she said, well, you know, I agree with everything except for this. And at that time, on the back of our bulletins, we had the statement of faith. And on the statement of faith, we, we talked about the inerrancy uh, of the word of God and the infallibility of the word of God. And she said, well, I have an issue with that. She, and her issue was, no, the word of God isn't, but the Pope is. And so our lunch changed, and I didn't want to get into a big argument at that point, so I didn't. But, but it's, that, it's that concept, right? It's, and this is what these religious people are doing. They're taking their traditions and their rules and what they've determined is religious, and they've placed it above God's word. In the Protestant church, we can do that also. we got to be very careful. I have friends that are part of uh, Protestant denominations that teach an anti-Israel doctrine in their church. And I ask them, well, how do you deal with Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11? Essentially, they don't. Or they can't, or they have to say Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 means something different than it actually says. And you start looking at that. I, I have many friends that are Baptists, and, and Jiminy Crickets, they, I, I, the, my Baptist friends, God bless them, they're, they're wonderful friends, but man, they, sometimes they think that Baptist is as holy as the Word of God, but so be it. Very good Baptist friends. So all of you Baptists are not here to offend you either. <laughs> Pentecostals can get caught up in theirs. You start getting into the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are lifted over the Word of God to the place where the gifts can be interpreted as something different than what the Bible says. I, I have another friend that says you've got to be baptized in his church or you're not saved. And then there's people who say you've got to worship on, on Saturday and eat vegetables. And that's the truth. Or the same thing. But the word of God doesn't teach that. Here's the problem Jesus is confronting. They were interested in appearing religious, these men were, but they were not interested in being righteous. They were not interested in the righteousness that they could have from Christ. So they exalted the tradition of the elders, is exactly what Jesus says. So I'm not making it up. They exalted the tradition of the elder, elders the tradition of the handed down explanation that was not the word of God and they exalted that above the word of God so when the word of God said something, they would say something along the lines, well, it doesn't actually mean what it says. It actually means this. How do you know? The scribe wrote it here. The Pharisee said it. The rabbi told me, ah, 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 that is not what this means. But here's the catch with this. Hand washing was prescribed in the Old Testament in the worship of God. The hand washing was. But here's the problem with it. The hand washing could not save you. The whole purpose of the rituals and the ceremonies in the Old Testament, they had one primary purpose. You know what it was? They pointed to Christ who was coming. This is how holy you need to be. 
your hands, your head, your heart, everything about you. But you aren't going to get there on your own. So these rituals showed them you needed the Savior who is going to come. Colossians tells us so. Let no one judge you in food or in drink regarding a festival, that would be a Jewish feast day, or a new moon, or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. All of the rituals of the Old Testament, they pointed to Christ. Even so, check this out, Ephesians chapter 5, right? The great passage on marriage between a man and a woman. Are you familiar with that passage? Okay, the passage of marriage between a man and a woman. You want to know what it is? You can say it's a shadow of the substance because the Bible tells us, the Apostle Paul says, after he talks about the marriage between a husband and wife, he says, this is the mystery. I'm speaking of Christ and the church. Marriage between a man and a woman also points to the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that fascinating? That's why God looks at marriage the way that he does. But all of the ceremonies of the Old Testament were to point to Christ. But here's the deal. Jesus answers them. He says, man, you guys got a problem. You're challenging me and my men on washing of hands, and you're interpreting the law all wrong. You don't want me. You just want your religion. So he challenges them, and he says, answer me this. Why is it that you transgress the commandment of God and you do not, where it says, honor your mother and father? Verse 4, you don't honor your mother and father. You don't do that. Verse 5, but what do you do? Whoever says, this is what you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God, Then, verse 6, he need not honor his father or mother. Thus, you've made the commandment of God no effect by your interpretation of God's commandment to honor your mom and dad. This is what's going on here. He says, you've you've said by saying this is a gift to God, you don't have to honor mom and dad. How does this work out, Pastor Tom? Let me show you, all right? Mark, chapter 7, exact same conversation is going on. Jesus lets us know that Corbin is a a gift to God. The same conversation. You honor your mother and father. You're supposed to do that. But instead of honoring your mother and father, when they come to you and say, I need a hundred dollars, I need a hundred shekels, whatever it is, you say, Corbin, this is what you say. Listen to this. You say, Corbin, my hundred dollars, my hundred shekels is a gift to God. And then you say, therefore, I don't have to honor mom and dad. How does this work out? I'm going to explain it to you. All right? You got money in your bank account. Your mom and dad, they're elderly. They don't have enough money for groceries. They come to you. You're a good son. You go to church. You're a religious man. They come to you and they say, uh, hey, son, we're short on groceries this week. We need 100 bucks. Could you help us out? What they say in response, this is where Jesus is challenging them. You say to your mom and dad, instead of giving them 100 bucks, you say, Corbin. You use that word, Corbin, my money, my hundred bucks, is a gift set aside to God. Oh, son, really? You set aside your money to God so you can't help us out? Nope. Mom and dad leave. They close the door. Now check this out. After they leave and they close the door and they've said, Corbin, it's a gift to God, they can also unwind the whole deal. You know how they do it? They say Corbin again. By saying Corbin again, now they can say, aha, mom and dad, that money wasn't good for you because at the time you were here, it was a gift to God. Now that mom and dad are gone, they say Corbin again, it unwinds it, and they say, you know what, God, that money is not for you either. This is what Jesus is getting at. You look at this and you're going, seriously, seriously? So it's this type of reasoning, this type of thinking. Here's the deal. Facts are facts. The truth is the truth. You can say the word of God means this or it means that, but it is what it is and it says what it says and it means what it says. We can attempt to say it, or we can say it means whatever we want to say to fit our own sin or fit our own reasoning or fit our own excuses, but it does not change the fact that the facts are the facts and the truth is the truth. So this is what Jesus is getting at. Make sense? 
Okay, we go to the last thing, and what do we recognize? It's the judge who condemns. He's not condemning. God doesn't condemn people just to condemn them. But when a person rejects him, these religious people had these opportunities. They know what the word of God said. What they wanted was their religion. What they didn't want was a savior. They didn't want to have to call what they were doing was sin. They didn't want to have to call it sin. They didn't want to have to repent. No, I've got my religion. I'm going to get there upon the prescribed law. Jesus said, man, you're interpreting it all wrong. The law is pointing you to me. Recognize that you're a sinner and you can be forgiven of your sins. Now he's going to, we go down to the end. Verse 10. When Jesus called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a man. His disciples came and they said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Yeah, Jesus knew they were offended. Go, whoopee-doo. My word offends. Let them be offended. The first time you were told you were a sinner, did it offend you? It probably did. And then you started to think about it. A few years after that, you said, you know what? I am a sinner. I do need forgiveness. They were offended. He answered, verse 13, and said, every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone, he says. Let the Pharisees alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leaves the blind, both will fall into the ditch. In other words, he's saying, look, they don't want me. What they have is their own method and their own attempt to get into heaven. They know that's not the truth, but they refuse to accept me. They refuse to recognize that they are sinners. They are blind. And they're going to lead other people that are just like them. They'll want to take the word of God and say, well, it means something else. It doesn't mean this. And they're going to lead that group of people. Let them fall into their own ditch. It moves on from there. Verse 15, then Peter answered and he said to him, explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, are you also without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? In other words, you, you eat and you use the facilities, right? It's real simple. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a person. In verse 10, Jesus says, hear and understand. In other words, listen carefully and pay close attention. Jesus was very clear on the gospel, all right? He's very clear. Because of his clarity, he was rejected. It's been said, rightly, at the moment the gospel is the clearest, is when it often becomes the most unacceptable. Uh, it's, think of the, all the people, they saw the great miracles, right? According to John chapter 6, Jesus is very clear, I am the bread of life, you must repent, you must receive me for the forgiveness of your sin. Whoa, 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 whoa. We just want the free food, right? When the gospel was clear, it was rejected. And then he says, it's not what you eat that defiles you. What, what defiles you is the heart. What's in the heart comes out of the mouth. He says it defiles you. That word for defile, it means unclean or polluted. Real simple. What you eat does not defile your soul. If it's poultry or bacon or vegetables or locusts or lizards, they might mess up your body, right? But it is going to have no eternal effect on your soul. You are not forgiven because you went home today and had locusts for lunch. Or you're a vegetarian. Or you eat bacon or you don't eat bacon. Listen, or you eat, listen, donuts don't defile you. <laughs> Seriously, they might, I mean, they, they cause me serious problems. But uh, they aren't going to have, they have no effect on your soul. And that's what Jesus is saying. The problem is the problem of the heart. And according to Jesus, what's in your heart comes out of your mouth. That's what he says here. That's, why it's, that's what defiles you because it shows what's in your heart. Someone said this about your heart and your mouth. What's down in the well comes up in the bucket. How true it is. James said this about our words. Out of the same mouth... Proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? It can't. It's a heart thing. This is why 
Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 4, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Your heart discloses what, your mouth discloses what's going on in the heart. And this is what Jesus is getting at. So when Jesus confronts them, look, you can do all the rituals you want. You've taken the word of God. I've heard what you said. You've twisted it. It's disclosing what's really there. You're making excuses for your sin and anybody to follow you. And you're driving them from knowing me. And when Jesus confronted them on it, verse, 10, verse 12 tells us they were offended by what Jesus said. So what do we have? On the one hand, when the people came to him, he healed them, right? Even though they rejected him, he still healed them. And on the other hand, we find out with those who are religious, we find out that they attempted to be right with God by keeping the rules that they made. But Jesus says, man, you're condemned. I have come to save you from the condemnation, for God did not send his son into this world to condemn you, but that through him you might be saved. They rejected that. They said, I'm going to get there my way. 